Okay, so I'm going to be able to say it, guys. Okay, so welcome back for the start of the second day. So before we begin, just a quick announcement. So there'll be a conference photo uh, right after the talk, just before lunch. So that'll take place at about 12. So just stick around um, at the end of that talk. I'll announce it again closer. Um, so first talk today, I'd like to have Oren uh, ben and he'll be talking about FANAC hard break yeah, Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Tamin Young and all the organizers for such an exciting conference and such a nice uh, community of mathematicians. And it's very inspiring. So um, I titled my talk uh, on a algebraic geometry. And here's the two. Um, oh, and this is a uh, this is based on um, articles, preprints, conversations with um, Kobe Kremnitzer. Uh, Jack Kelly, who's actually speaking after me, and and others. Okay, so here's the two um, goals I want to set out. So uh, find some kind of common language. for many different kinds of geometry. Okay, so this includes, uh, and I mean uh, derived geometry. So this includes things like uh, algebraic geometry, uh, complex analytic geometry, a rigid geometry over a non Archimedean field, and um, things like differential geometry as well. Okay, and that's the first uh, objective. But really, um, the, the reason I'm doing this is to find applications uh, to the topics of this workshop. Mm -hmm. So I think this kind of point of view applies to all the topics of the workshop eventually. Uh, those are gauge, gauge fields in arithmetic topology and physics, but I'm going to focus on something uh, that I think uh, indicates that there's applications to uh, arithmetic geometry at the end of the talk. So let me, let me start out um, with a little bit of category theory. It's just going to be five minutes, and then I'm going to get into more concrete things. So 
um, we're, we're going to use the point of view of uh, higher category theory and uh, the viewpoint that it gives on geometry. So this, this includes uh, work upon, but so let's see. And blurry. And th there's different, different uh, points of view from the higher category viewpoint. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, mention something from an article of uh, Raxit. And he kind of draws on both of these to some extent. So his uh, starting point of view is a stable, presentable symmetric minoidal category. And the the one you should have in mind, first of all, is just uh, chain complexes of abelian groups. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give another one uh, after I give the general setup, and it's the second one that I'm going to I'm going to uh, you know the se the second one kind of applies to all of these, whereas the first one. Mainly applies just to this one. Okay, so I'm not going to write out the general definition, it's rather long. But first of all, uh, the C is equipped with a T structure. It's called a compatible T-structure. Um, so I, I'm not going to say all the axioms, but this guy is closed under filtered co-limits. I'm using homological grading convention in case I say something to you that sounds opposite to something you expect. The, the unit object of C um, should lie in C greater than or equal to zero. And C greater than or equal to zero is closed under the tensor product. So let me let me write the tensor product for the minimal structure just like this. And it, this guy is closed. And you, he also assumes a full subcategory in the heart. So the heart is the intersection of these guys, and it's, a, it's an abelian category. And he's going to assume a full uh, symmetric monoidal subcategory. Of of uh, which are whose objects are compact projective generators. So you should have in mind, um, for instance, uh, free um, free abelian groups, finite free abelian groups in, in this example. But I'm going to give them a, a new example. And uh, Raxit explains um, that you can start to do geometry with this. So from here, you're going to define uh, affine schemes. And there's actually two, two definitions that are not always the same. 
uh, under some conditions on the on the field of character, if it's characteristic zero over a field, if, if C is uh, tensored over a field, then I believe these are the same, but there's there's kind of two categories you can build out of C. And these, these are gonna be the, is this a board or? Yeah. <laughs> is, do I write on this? No, <laughs> that's why it's so clean. Okay, so there's two there's two categories that you build out of C um, of of algebras, and your affine schemes are just the opposite category. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pay much attention to the the difference between these two. But I'm actually interested in in operations you could do with either one of them. So let me not. Um, let me not make a. Let me not distinguish too much which one I'm talking. About. They, they are different. For instance, even over the integers, they, the sort of affine line is is different in the two cases. The affine line is sim of the, of the unit. Okay, so, but I'm I'm not going to distinguish right now. So uh, let's let affine C. Is one of the above. Is the opposite category of one of the above. Okay, so now we want to um, define uh, non affine schemes and um, and uh, we need we need a topology on on uh, actually even on affine schemes we need a topology. Um, for instance, if we want to talk about vector bundles um, on an, on an affine scheme, uh, well, okay. If we if we want to want to glue vector bundles and things like that, we need a topology. We want to say that something is locally of some form. We need to say what we mean by locally. So here's some topologies you can define and. I'm focusing on topologies that don't have any kind of finiteness conditions because um, in analytic applications, I'm not, it, uh, it's not clear how to, uh, the, the, some of the objects you want just don't satisfy finiteness conditions. So what kind of topologies can we define in, in complete generality? So there's the Zariski topology. Let's make a list of, some topologies. And later I'm going to go down my list and see see uh, see which one I want in, in different situations. Okay, so here for the Zariski topology, you just um, to, to give a cover. Okay. A is uh, one of these ring objects. Um, you just choose elements F1 through Fn generating the unit ideal. Okay, and then uh, on, the, on, the, on the algebraic level, your cover is just A goes to the product of F1 to Fn. In terms of affine schemes, this is like a disjoint union mapping down to the the scheme uh, represented by it. Yes. Okay. Um, another. Let me make a definition before I give the next apology. With abstract setting, can you actually choose elements? Um, you can choose elements in uh, I zero, for instance. There's uh, there is something. More to say though, I mean, to make this. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you can you can take maps from the unit into. There's elements that. So let me make a definition before I define the next topology. So A goes to B is flat. I think this goes back to Larry, this definition, faithfully flat. 
Oh, I should say one thing. Um, I'm interested uh, for in derived geometry, you consider connective objects in these guys. So you you consider so connective objects. But I'm actually interested in topologies that that work in the connective or non-connective setting. Although usually you you take your affine schemes to be connective objects, sometimes it's interesting to, to look at non-connective affine schemes. Okay, so F is flat or faithfully flat if uh, if um, the induced map on pi zero <laughs> is flat or faithfully flat. And I, I of B. Okay, so um, just you can just take faithfully flat covers. That's another example of the topology. Let's call that the faithfully flat topology. It's equivalent to. Uh, Answering is exactly uh, in the connective setting. I'm not sure about in general. Yeah. So the next example is is the one that I think is less uh, less in the literature, but I think it's very important. So um, covers. Uh, so definition uh, covers. So th th this was kind of um, mentioned by Tom Vitozzi, but it was never it was never sort of used in its full power. Um, covers in the monomorphism topology. I'm going to consider a finite product. Let's just call this B. So, so such that A to B, A to AI, the projection map is an epimorphism in the categorical sense, which is here the infinity category. I'll say what it means. It means that um, it means that the map mapping space from any C to AI into the mapping space from C to A. Um, has all fibers either empty or discrete or contractible. But this is like direct category theory, infinity category theory. Um, and it's and it should be faithful also. And uh, if B tensors with something to zero, some some uh, module. This should be zero if and only if the module is zero. So this is called faithfulness sometimes. Okay, and one more. Oh, the other way around. Uh, sorry? Should be IB on the. Oh, oh sorry, the, sorry. In, in map. Uh, oh, uh, the maps from AI to C, sorry. Wait, hold on. Yeah, sorry, AI to C. So A to C, sorry, thank you. So this should be a, all fibers should be empty or contract. Okay, 
So the last topology is um, is due to Bargov Bath. Um, so definition. So A to B is a weekly at all. If it is flat, and this multiplication map is flat, so let me um, let me just say some some geometric things also about the previous topology. So, um, uh, well. Okay, so this this first of all, this epimorphism condition can be written as just AI tensor A AI is equivalent to AI, which is saying that AI is its own self-intersection, which re really is um, it's it's an equivalent condition. It, it's also equivalent to say that the category of modules for AI embeds fully faithful into the category of modules for A. So you can think of it as sort of a non-commutative geometry definition as well. And um, yeah, so right, and, and this this definition is saying that uh, the map on schemes is is flat, and the map um, uh, into the diagonal the, the diagonal map is also flat. So I just want to point out if if it was a mon if A to B were a monomorphism, then this condition would be an isomorphism, but it, but this condition may not hold. So monomorphism does not imply that this is flat. There's two there's two conditions here. Okay, so the last of the last topology I'm going to mention is this uh, weekly et al topology, where again you have to take um faithful covers. Okay, and so let me um, let me sketch the relationship between these topologies really quick. Any questions? So I'll just make a diagram summarizing some relations. So I, I, I'm not going to go through the actual Ital topology. There's, there is also a definition of that, which is going to appear in the preprints with uh, me, Jack, and Kobe. Um, I'll, I'll just say it in words. So, um, um, an Ital morphism is just going to be one satisfying the determinant condition. So, the, in particular, it's a finite. You know, we're talking about fi the finite detail topology. So here's a here's a sketch of the relationship. So we have uh, Zariski covers. This is kind of the you know the least. There's the least of this type of cover. The mono covers. But when I when I say something geometrically, I'll use mono. When I'm talking about rings, I'll say epi. Uh, the faithfully flat covers, the weak at all covers, the tall covers. And then well, we found it kind of disturbing because, see, in algebraic geometry, as a risky open is at all. But instead of Zariski opens, we're going to replace, I mean, we're going to prefer to look at these monomorphisms. So we found it kind of weird that nothing, you know, we wanted to be able to compare these somehow. So I'll write to be announced. This is also a topology that we're going to talk about and prove that it's not a first descent and things like that. Okay, so as I said, um, all of these covers do, 
do make sense in, in just algebraic geometry. So when C is mod Z, these are all reasonable things to consider, even though they don't have uh, finiteness conditions on them. Oops, this is also uh, here. But um, let me now give some motivation for the next uh, example of a C that I want to consider. So uh, when you study analytic or smooth geometry, the first thing you can notice is that the rings you're dealing with are huge. They're non Noetherian, uh, not finitely presented, et cetera. Um, so there's kind of two uh, broad ways to deal with that. One is to add extra algebraic structure, uh, which I think sometimes people call functional calculus or the Vera theories. Uh, the second way is to add extra analytic structure to the rings. So, for instance, Frechet. Uh, dual for Shea, et cetera. And I'm going to choose the second option, but there, there is a way to go between them. So if you have, uh, if you have like um, some kind of analytic structure on the line and you have a holomorphic functional calculus, you can induce an analytic structure on basically anything and vice versa. Um, if, if you, yeah, so you, you can go back and forth. Um, I believe, although I, I don't think that's carefully, that kind of equivalent is carefully written down. Here, but, and so, so, uh, and wh why do we need to do all this? Why do we need to consider these huge rings? Well, one, one motivation is that in analytic geometry, a complex analytic geometry, for instance, You know, the holomorphic functions on X plus Y are definitely not the tensor product, but they're the completed tensor product. Like even on even on C cross C, you know, you can write down a, you can easily write down a function for it, something like you know e to the zw that, that is not in the algebraic tensor product, but rather in the completed tensor product. And in order to even define completed tensor product, we need extra um, structure on these rings. Okay, so let me now start the description of this category C that I said I would, that I, I said I need in order to do this kind of generalized form of geometry. So the starting point is going to be to fix a Banach ring, so not necessarily a field. So a Banach ring is basically a ring um, with a complete norm, and the multiplication is bounded. The addition satisfies the triangle inequality and in norm. Um, so here's our my favorite example. So and we're going to call it R. So favorite examples. P, ZP, R, QP, the Tate algebra for K a non Archimedean field, or C double bracket T. With the attic norm, and you could take the you could take the trivial norm on C, or or actually you can take um, yeah, let's say uh, with the attic. No, sorry, I'm taking the attic norm, so the trivial norm on C, and also C formal Laurent series. So all of these are complete. Of course, the initial one is Z, so that's kind of the most important one. Um, and now we're going to consider the category bon R. So let me make uh, steps. So bon R. These are just, uh, you know, they, they have a norm satisfying the triangle inequality. It's compatible with R, and they're complete. And this is a very nice category, except it's it's terrible because it's not closed under limits and co-limits. Okay. But other than that, it's great. 
And for instance, the co-kernel, the categorical co-kernel, you should keep in mind that the co-kernel of V, the W is not the quotient as, as modules, but rather you have to quotient by the closure of the set theoretic image. Okay, so the next step is to adjoin formal filtered co-limits. Okay, and um, I'll just, what I'll do is I'm going to define for you the monoidal structure and the internal HOM. So this is a closed symmetric monoidal quasi-abelian category. Let, let's not go into the definition of quasi-abelian, but it's very similar to an abelian category. So let's denote objects, say, by V and W. So if V is kind of a formal filtered co-limit over some filtered category, or po you can deal with post sets, it's enough partially ordered sets. And say another object so no, nobody tells me that it's the same category, but um, you can always form one to, you know, form one in which they can be compared. In which that, you know, you, so, so there's many different ways of writing every object. This is by no means like unique. Okay, and the tensor works just, just uh, tensor VI and WJ and the internal HOM um, V and W is the limit over I, the limit over J of the HOM, internal HOM of v, v, I and WJ. Okay, and final definition in terms of quasi-abelian, oh, there's a few more definitions. I think I need to go a little faster now. Could you repeat what ban R is? But ban R is just um, the category of R modules equipped with a norm, a complete norm satisfying the triangle inequality, and it should be compatible with the multiplication on R. Um, so E to W is called strict. It's the co-kernel of uh, the kernel of F to V is isomorphic to the kernel of W goes to the co-kernel of F. And the projective object In in bond is that um, you do get a surjection for all strict epimorphisms. And a flat object. So as, as usual, projectives are flat, and a flat object is uh, one such that um, F tensor V, F tensor W is a, is a strict mono for all strict monos. So strict just means strict mono just means strict and category free mono. Okay, and something that uh, yeah. Uh, where's the co-limit happening? In? Like the co-limit is is uh, formal, so it's happening in the category of pre sheaves on on von pre sheaves of abelian groups. Or, or sets uh, on on bon R, so functors from the opposite category. With the underlying ring, the co-limits happening in like ring. So, so you can form an underlying uh, module out of this. 
by passing to the co-limit in the category of modules. You, you can form that. Okay, so just one thing for Jack's talk. There's another, sometimes it's nice to work with a subcategory of Indbon. It's called Seaborn, and it's just those objects that are represented by systems of monomorph. Why is it called Born? Because if R is, say, uh, complex numbers or ZP or some nice enough ring, you get a category equivalent to certain types of Bornological vector spaces, which is something old from functional analysis. It's basically a vector space together with this notion of bounded set satisfying certain axioms. So just like a topological space has a certain collection of subsets. So the Bornological space has a certain collection of subsets. So there's a Seaborn has, has another meaning, but that's only over nice enough uh, rings. And so now I'm ready to define the category that um, I'm gonna work, we can work with. So if you remember, uh, it was a symmetric monoidal infinity category, but it had within it a um, uh, inside its heart, it had this category of projectors. And it turns out you can you can get it. I mean, at least sometimes you that's enough. So um, let me define C0. I'm not going to be completely rigorous here in terms of size issues, but you can take the category of projectives in Inbon. I mean, in reality, you need to uh, to look at certain projectives. Then, so. you're, supposed, you're supposed to you're supposed to be compact. Um, same as taking projectives in bond. Yeah, sorry. In, in, yeah, take C zero to be uh, the category of projectives in bond. Not in there. Yeah. Now you take C zero to to be the sifted co-completion, which is sometimes called P sigma. And take C to be the stabilized the stabilized category. This is a kind of process that gives you a candidate for a context, but uh, you need to actually check that it gives a context. Okay, and to be more explicit, um, these guys are just modeled by simplicial in Banach spaces. Right, S in the bond. So Jack's going to be talking also about a nonlinear version of this where you take norm sets. Um, it's, it's not a direct uh, analog. There's some things that aren't, aren't exactly the same there. Um, okay, so what kind of building blocks do we have in this kind of uh, geometry? So, um, we can start with uh, disks and tensor them together to get higher dimensional disks, but there's many different kinds of disks. So uh, building blocks, and, and then we then we can take um, then we could take intersections of affine schemes. Uh, so we can take intersections of A1. So we can take maps from A N, <laughs> take the fiber over zero to get more uh, interesting um, uh, objects, but still the basic building blocks. Well, you have the polynomial guy. It's not a Banach space. It's an end Banach space. You have um, this disk algebra, which is sort of similar to the Tate algebra, but it's a kind of non archimedean version. So I'll just, I'll just remark that these are formal power series where the sum of the AI R to the I is less than infinity. But you can still define this for any R. Um, you have, um, what else? 
Yeah, so there's many different uh, guys you, you have here. So, um, so um, oh, you have this guy, you have an overconvergent version. Um, trying to get the order correct here. And you have this sort of Stein version, which is, so So this is a co-limit over big, like uh, similar to what uh, Jonathan Pridham uh, defined. Dagger version over converted functions. You also have the Stein guys. I'm not sure how that didn't get that. Disk of radius R and the formal power series. And probably there's many more. I haven't uh, characterized all of these. But you have all these end Banach things, and these are your these are your basic building blocks. You can just uh, similar to the way that you can build algebraic geometry out of A ones, you can build different flavors of analytic geometry out of these building blocks. So um, I should also remark that the you know when doing computations or something, the monoidal structure, which I just called tensor before, is now the completed derived tensor product. Okay, so let's give an example. So, so now um, comes the time to start choosing which categories, which topologies to take. So let me give an example that kind of surprised us at first and it pointed us in the right direction. So I'll give a, an example that comes from non-Archimedean geometry of affinoids. So I, I haven't been distinguishing different, I mean, the Archimedean versus the non-Archimedean tensor product. So if you, if you restrict the non-Archimedean Bonnet spaces over a non-Archimedean Bonnet ring, you can do everything just using the non-Archimedean tensor product. Somebody wants, I can write the definitions of these two tensors. But, so let A just be the one-dimensional disk, the functions on the one-dimensional disk. I'll take a disk of radius one third inside of it. And I'll take an annulus of inner radius half, outer radius half. So that's uh, A, that's QP of X, Z over two, modulo XZ minus one. So let me draw the situation. We have our large disk. We have a disk of radius one third. And then we have a disk, an annulus of radius half. So I'll just I'll just write V in here. And so the surprising thing is that uh, a, a V is not flat over A. So even though flatness is a very important condition in uh, non-Archimedean geometry, it's definitely not uh, the complete picture because you see even this basic guy is not flat. Um, and just to prove that, well, first of all, notice that W intersect V is empty. So you can just take the, and you, you can show that the inclusion from A to AW is strict. So I can just tensor the sequence with AV. If I tensor or so the, the actual results, um, be careful if I take the non Archimedean complete tensor, keep it derived over A of A uh, B. I'm just trying to say that there are tors when tensoring with A. B. So if I tensor with the quotient, I actually just get a shift of A B. I guess I'm now using the cohomological convention. So basically, when you tensor with A V, you get A V goes to zero. So a strict uh, mono is no longer a strict mono. Okay, so 
So we, we consider the monomorphism topology. So I'll just write that out in case people don't remember how it was defined. I'll just define it in this setting. So I can take conservative covers or uh, faithful covers by finite collections of homotopy monomorphisms. So I, I am using the word homotopy now because I'm now using, I'm now in a, in a model setting. I'm no longer in the infinity category setting. So I, I will write derived, I will write else. So we're now gonna consider this covers, finite cover where all of them satisfy this condition. Okay, so a result uh, with myself and Kremnitzer from 2013. So this, this definition fully reconstructs the rigid topology on affinoids. or the rigid site, however you want to say it. Um, Affinoids over a non-Archimedean field. <clears throat> what is the condition? What's the finite? Oh, so a finite number of oh, alphas. Number of and then the, uh, I didn't write down the conservativity condition. So they should be surjective in some sense. Okay, so the key uh, thing is this here, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so I have um, 15 more minutes. That's perfect. I'm going to now move to the arithmetic setting. Okay, so let me give some things I hope to do. Um, some of this is probably not, you know. So you have five minutes until oh. 9 15. Oh, okay. Five, uh, is that correct? It says 10, oh, five minutes. You're right. Okay, so I'll, I'll go fast. Thank you. I think that's still enough time. Okay, so um, my hope is to maybe uh, analyze or, or enlarge the Berkovich spectrum of So let me draw a picture of that. The points represent fields. Q triv means Q with the trivial valuation. Uh, this is F2, F3, et cetera. U2, U3, et cetera. And you can also take line segments. So for instance, the segment from here to here is Z2, et cetera. The segment from here to here is the completion of Q. <clears throat> With respect to the max of the uh, usual norm, the Archimedean norm, and the trivial norm. Okay, so I'd like to find uh, interesting covers by homotopy monos. So a cover now is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm going to allow also infinite collections. Such that when you tensor these guys over with themselves, you get themselves. Our alphas should be end Banach rings. They don't have to be Banach rings. Yeah. Okay, and one uh, well, somewhat conjectural property of these, um, of the functions, is this kind of duality that I've been looking at. So, all right. Question mark, because I've only checked it in some cases, but uh, let's say you take a subspace of M of Z. And you compute X to one of the functions on that subspace into Z. And this should be the functions on the complement. Sorry? M of Z. Oh, M of Z is just the Berkovich spectrum of Z. Sorry.
So the functions you associate to the complement modulo z. So this is kind of related to Pontryagin duality, but let me just uh, let me just end by giving two examples of covers. So the first example, well, you have z, the zp dagger, which I'm just going to define as z of px dagger, the overconvergent functions on the disk of radius one over p module x minus p, and z. Another uh, in Banach ring, which is defined as the limit over R less than P, C, Y over R <coughs> dagger, but actually without the dagger, modulo P, Y minus one. <laughs> so geometrically, what this cover does is it takes. takes one of these guys and it just takes this part of it and then it just takes everything else. So my the two open sets are these two. Okay. And for the other cover, it's going to be infinite and it resembles, it's related to the integral Adels, I believe. I'll just draw the cover quickly and define the rings, and that's going to be the end of the talk. So in this cover, we're going to have sort of an overconvergent guy. It's because it's overconvergent, I guess I'll make this extra big here. Um, and then all of the open line segments. So now I'll write the rings. I'll write them in uh, blue and green. So this blue line segment, the functions on it are going to be, I'll just write it, I'll just call them R dagger. Taking the co-limit over positive natural numbers of Z Y dagger, I want to think of y as sort of a dual variable to x. And I'll define z, p, tilde. Oh, this should be in green. z, p, tilde. So there's a kind of dual for shade slash for shade thing going. Oh, this is yellow. Okay, ZP tilde, a limit over R less than one, X minus P. Okay, so I'm claiming that these, that these are homotopy Fs and form a cover. And uh, if you, it, it resembles the Adele's in the sense that we have Z, goes to our dagger across the product of ZP tildes over all primes. Okay, thanks very much. Hey, thank you for the talk. Questions for Oren? Right.